Well, hello, how are you? My name is Jeff. I'm so glad you could be with me today. You know, in the late 1950s, a group of writers that included William Burroughs, Allen Ginsberg, and Jack Kerouac started a new literary subculture movement that was called the Beat Generation. The folks involved in this new lifestyle were dubbed by the media as the Beatniks, a term coined to make fun of this movement, because the media really never caught on to what this movement was all about. And near the end of the 1950s, films were being made to capitalize on this movement. Films such as The Beatniks from 1958, and A Bucket of Blood, The Rebel Set, and The Beat Generation, all from 1959. None of these films were made by people who had an understanding of what was going on. Today I'm going to talk about a film that was first shown on Mystery Science Theater 3000 on July 20th, 1991. It was a, I guess, a beatnik crime film called Daddy-O, directed by Lou Place and starring Dick Contino, Sandra Giles, Bruno DeSoto, John McClure, and many other wonderful people. This was the episode in which Joel and the bots pretend to be marketing people talking around the water cooler. Joel's invention was an air freshening mobile for babies, while Dr. Forrester invents an alien face hugger teeth nook, using the adult baby from the week before. Joel and the bots do a parody of a song that was in the film, which they call Hike Your Pants Up. There's a drag race between Crow and Servo, and Joel demonstrates different spit takes before he gets interrupted by a character from the film. Now, for those new to the show, while I'm talking about a film that was first shown on Mystery Science Theater 3000, I'm more talking about the film itself and not Joel and the bot's treatment of the film, though there'll be a little at the end. Meet the Beat, Daring to Live, Daring to Love. Daddy-O. So there isn't really much to talk about as far as the production of this film. It was made by a company called Imperial Productions for about $100,000 and was distributed by American International Pictures. Imperial Productions was a company owned by Elmer Roden Jr. Elmer lived from 1922 to 1959. His previous films were The Delinquents from 1957 and The Cool and the Crazy from 1958. Sadly, Elmer died of a heart attack at the young age of 37 before this film got released. This film was at the end of AIP's juvenile delinquency rebellion beat culture early rock and roll phase. Their fascination with what they called the beatniks was beginning to fade and there were only traces of that in this film. In a few years, they would be more into beach films and then the hippie drug culture. The thing that made researching this film difficult was that, using old newspapers like I always do, that by 1959, hip beat language was becoming sort of a joke. And when I researched the title Daddy-O, I got hundreds of articles that were like this. But what's more interesting than the film itself was its star, Dick Contino. Dick played Phil Sandifer, a.k.a. Daddy-O. Richard Joseph Contino lived from 1930 to 2017. He was born in Fresno, California, and here's the thing. He was an accordion player, a very good accordion player. Early on, he was winning accordion competitions. Hey, who knew there was such a thing? By the late 1940s, he had played the Ed Sullivan Show a record 46 times. It was said he was earning as much as $4,000 a week, not only as an accordion player, but as a singer as well. By 1951, things began to change. He was drafted into the army during the Korean War, but went AWOL during boot camp, turning up in an LA sanitarium, having some sort of weird breakdown. He was fined $10,000 and served six months in jail. He said, I kept going at the same pace. The offers kept pouring in and I saw no reason not to take them. I was young, I felt strong and I was enjoying myself. I didn't realize what the fast pace was doing to me until the crack up came. Then I had plenty of time to think about it. Getting out of prison, he volunteered for the army sort of to make up for what he had done. Once his time with the army was over, he resumed his career and things were going pretty well until in mid-1954, he was in trouble for not paying taxes and by 1947, his career began to taper off. By the end of that year, he had a wife and daughter, but found himself heavily in debt due to unpaid booking agencies, back union dues, as well as gambling losses and back taxes. 
so he filed for bankruptcy. So by 1958, he decided it was time to be an actor and signed the play in the low-budget feature Daddy-O. In fact, he thought it was time to give up his accordion for a dramatic film career. And of course, Daddy-O was just a small-budget B-film. I know they aren't the best films ever made, but I get a kick out of doing them. And they'll probably never be endorsed by the PTA, he said. His financial and legal troubles weren't over just yet, but as far as his acting career, this was the highlight of it. He was also in the films The Beat Generation and Girls Town, both from the same year, and The Big Night in 1960. Now the blonde in the film, Jana Ryan, is played by Sandra Giles. Lilia Bernice Giles lived from 1932 to 2016. This was her film debut after doing a couple of TV appearances. Years earlier, she had been discovered in Cantor's Delicatessen in Los Angeles by a press agent and began a career in modeling. She was one in a long line of pretty blondes with a sexy figure that came after Marilyn Monroe. Of course, don't tell her that. Like in 1956, when she posed for a painting for a casino in a bathing suit, but the artist instead painted her naked. I don't want to be a Marilyn Monroe, blonde Sandra Giles, 22, wailed as the artist took the wraps off a nude in repose. I want to be an actress. I didn't pose that way. I had a bathing suit on. I read somewhere that that was all a publicity stunt that she was in on it, but I really can't say for sure. Apparently, they called her Miss Two for One, and I'm not really sure why. Starlet Sandra Giles, 23, a curvaceous blonde with brown eyes and a 38-23-35 figure, has been named Miss 8-Ball for 1958 by the Greater Los Angeles Press Club. This is the first time in my life I've ever been named anything, said Miss Giles with astonishing candor. I'm thrilled. After Daddy-O, she had a very successful career in television, appearing on almost all the popular shows of the time. Bruno Vesoto plays Sidney Childless. Bruno Williams Visoto lived from 1922 to 1976 and is sometimes referred to as the low-budget Orson Welles. He began in Chicago TV as a producer, director, and writer, and then moved into acting with appearances in The System and The Wild One. He has quite a few films of interest, such as Dementia from 55, Female Jungle from 55, The Brain Eaters from 58, Attack of the Giant Leeches from 59, the Wasp Woman, also from 59, Invasion of the Star Creature from 62, The Wild World of Batwoman from 66, and a lot more wonderful B films. In fact, he should probably be in the B movie Hall of Fame. He did a lot of television, including 21 episodes of Bonanza. Duke Manon plays the goofy Ron McNeil, and as far as I know, this was his only film, and I can find no information about the man. Anyway, that's about it for the cast. The director was Lou Place, and I can't find a lot of information about him. I know he was born in 1912, and this was the only film he ever directed. He was mainly a production manager and assistant director. He worked on such films as It Conquered the World from 56, Not of This Earth from 57, She Gods of Shark Reef from 58, and Agent for Harm from 1966. He was also the unit production manager on 102 episodes of the TV show Canon. It was written by David Mosinger. David lived from 1930 to 2018. This was early on in his career. David would become a TV writer and producer working on TV shows such as Quincy M.E., Simon and Simon, Jake and the Fat Man, Murder, She Wrote, and many others. So what is Daddy-O? The film starts off letting us know that we're in for a wild ride. If only it lived up to that promise. I do like the music, and we'll get into that a bit later. Phil, a truck driver, is making a delivery when a hot sports car cuts him off. This does not make Phil happy, but I'm more thinking about the dog. In fact, for the rest of the film, I'm wondering whatever happened to that dog. They pull over by a construction site, and it turns out the hot sports car is driven by a pretty blonde. Right away, they hate each other. Oh. He ran me off. Yeah, and if you were a man, baby, I'd knock your teeth out. He's been following me for the last hour. He's trying to pick me up, I guess. Wouldn't it be strange if they fall in love a little bit later? 
Anyway, later that evening, Bill heads to a dance club called Rainbow Gardens. Friends are already there. The place is really swinging. There's something troubling his friend Sonny. Hey, you're not with us tonight, man. He hasn't said a word all night. Hey, Sonny. Hey, is your mom okay? She's okay. But before they can get into it, look who walks into the bar. The blonde with the sports car. Her name is Jana, and one of Phil's friends knows her and brings her over to the table. I've already met Phil. You yeah. have? He almost wrecked my car today. I can't tell if Phil is angry or amused by her comment. But before we find that out, it's time for Phil to sing a song. How about a song from old Daddy-O himself? Go on. Your singing can't be any worse than your driving. Her, her kisses are crazy like a lollipop When I get one taste, I don't want to stop Oh, rock candy, baby, that's what I call my dream Oh, rock candy, baby, sweeter than a chocolate cream Live it up, dudes, the Beatles are only a few years away And who are these two? I'm guessing they're the bad guys, but that's just a guess They do some angry dancing, and neither of these two characters are all that likable Oh, sophisticated type, huh? Really been around. Enough to know what you've got on your mind. Give them the old come on, and then throw it right back in their face, huh? Don't be vulgar. You kill me, baby. Do I? I'm glad. The animosity between the two turns into a car race. He uh, must have learned from a correspondence school. <laughs> Are you serious? Phil's got a drawer full of drag race trophies. Or well, his son driving a carnival when he was 15. Well, I'm just a girl, and I'll race him any time, any place. Careful, sweetie. You're on thin ice. But before that happens, something weird is still going on with Sonny. Look, I'll be along later. Well, how come? I gotta make a call, see if my mom's all right. Go ahead, we'll wait for you. No, I might have to go home for a while. Okay. See you at Nick's, huh? And he gives Phil a key, Phil. and he doesn't say why. I've got to admit, I love this bass line. But the bad guy, well, he seems to have an interest in Sonny. And yep, Sonny is now out of the film. But we get an exciting car race, and a bunch of stuff happens. Hey, hold it, you. Hey, come back here. Jenna wins, but was it a fair race? A little maniac here forced me onto a dirt road. Like I said, anything goes. You didn't wreck your car. No, but I almost hit a night watchman. You mean the old guy with the station wagon? That's right. He was coming up that dirt road. If he got my license number, I've had it. But I got his license number. Well, damn the luck. And I'm not sure what exactly he did wrong except for speeding, but the cops arrest him just the same. Wait, there's more to the arrest than he knew about. Property, trespassing, reckless driving, hit and run and manslaughter. Hit and run and manslaughter. He's being blamed for Sonny's death. But quickly, we learn that he had nothing to do with it. But he's still in a bit of trouble. I'd say you were pretty lucky. Lucky? Huh. Look, Mr. Wooster, my best friend was buried this morning. Yesterday, I lost my job. I can't drive a car for a whole stinking year. Look at that. I wish we had hot dog stands like that where I live. Where is that crazy chick living? Who, Jana? Yeah, Jana. <laughs> I didn't think you'd be so anxious to see her again. So Phil thinks that Jenna might have had something to do with Sonny's death, so he goes to her place to investigate. You admit you killed Sonny. I almost ran off myself, smashed my headlights. Oh, you liar. If I'd forced him off, my right fender would have been smashed. You're right. Oh, Phil didn't think of that. All I want's coffee. Two coffees black, huh, honey? 
Hmm, you know, I thought they hated each other, but now they're going out for coffee. Surprise, surprise. Bill, do you really think somebody did it on purpose? You saw the skid marks. But he seemed so meek. He didn't say one word the whole time I was at the table. Sonny wasn't meek, baby. He was scared. Letty scared. And remember that key? Well, it turns out that belongs to a gym locker. Bill wants to find out what's in that locker, but that's not going to happen. Not with this goofy guy in the way. Let's have it, fella. Sure. We know something's up with this dramatic pan in. But Phil is determined to see what was in that locker, and he brings Jenna with them because, well, he needed a ride. Did it ever occur to him that that weird guy might have already cleared the locker out? He hasn't, but that's what I would have thought. But now the big guy shows up to help the goofy guy clean out the locker. Maybe. I don't know why you couldn't have done it by yourself. That's what I'm thinking. They find something inside, but I guess the audience doesn't need to know. But before Goofy Guy leaves, he wants to stop the dripping shower. Can't stand the odor in here much longer. Never mind, I got it. Yeah, that's how somebody you tightens a shower knob. Hmm. But Phil finds an empty cigar tube, and this might be a clue. And it turns out that the big guy, whose name is Sidney Chilis, is interested in Phil. May I buy you a drink? I'm in a hurry, Mac. It uh, might be worth your while. At first, Phil shows no interest until he notices the same cigar tube that he saw in the locker room. He wants Phil to be a singer. You feel kind of it? Yeah, that's right. I'm Marsha Hayes, Mr. Tillis Manicures. And as he gets a massage, we get a lot of exposition. And suppose, just suppose he is suspicious. What a better place to have him than right here under our noses. By hiring Phil as a singer, they can now keep track of him. Plus, they might have something else for him to do. You really think I'm that good? Good enough to offer, in addition to the salary I quoted last night, that car I showed you, and his license. So now he has a car and a fake driver's license. And love is in the air. Phil. So remember, baby. No one can know who I am or where I went. Not even Duke and Peg. I guess he's working sort of undercover and he's using a new name. Well, clue me. Who are you now? Daddy-o. Daddy-o? Yeah. You know what? I'm beginning to like that name. We get another tune, but this isn't exactly my type of song. Why do you put on your angela? I could tell everyone it's a fact. You've got the devil in your eye. And we find out that Jana is going to work for Sydney Chilis because I think she wants to help. And after a third tune by Daddy O, it seems that Phil has eyes for another woman who works at the bar, and this doesn't make Jana happy. This whole part of the story goes nowhere. Anyway, to make a long story short, Phil is going to deliver a package, which we can only assume is drugs, for Chilis. Oddly, we don't see the drop-off. Was this a stylish directorial decision, or one of those we don't have the time or the money to shoot that scene decisions? But somebody is suspicious. Jana is flirting with another guy, but we don't have time for that. It's another package delivery. All set? Sure. Same as last time? Same as last time. Gift wrapped. This time, however, the cops are waiting. And we get a chase. That's an amazing flying car. 
He gets away, but the gangsters think they have been double-crossed. And we get a little cool jazz on the way, and I'm digging this music. is as confused as me? Who is Pete Plum? And why do these bad guys think that this isn't Pete Plum? How would they know? I don't know. Anyway, Phil has the whole thing figured out. Got this thing figured out, Janet. It's simple. Sonny was delivering for Chilas, but double-crossed him and put the drugs in his locker. Chilas found out and forced him off the road. That's right. Well, who did this? The guy who paid his money sent out a couple of the boys to see why he didn't get anything. They thought I was Sonny. They thought he was Sonny? I thought they thought he was Pete Plum. Or was Sonny Pete Plum? I don't know. Now there's a big drug shipment coming by boat, and Phil, with Jana's help, wants to blow the whole thing wide open. But while spying on Chilas, they are caught by that goofy guy. All right, you two. I've got a gun on you. Now listen carefully, our lives depend on this. You, my suspicious friend, are going to pick up some money for me. Bruce will accompany you to make sure of a successful and hasty return. You, my dear, you'll remain here with me. That should be a little added incentive for Philip. And it turns out the goofy guy has a plan of his own. Turn right. I know it's left. I said right, right boy. Look, if we're not back to that club in 20 minutes, that girl's gonna die. What's the difference? He'd kill you both anyway. But Phil is too smart and too tough for him. So now Phil tries to rush back to save Jenna. But he's too late. So Childess puts her into a room that's filled with gas or steam or something. That children is called a payphone. Go ask your parents. Give me the police right away, please. So we get a final battle between Phil and Chilas while Jana is being poisoned. Quick, Phil! Goofy guy returns, and he and Jana go looking for the money. Did he get the money? I could hardly hear. I think he lost it fighting with you. He lost it fighting. Come on, I need you. And here come the police. And this is still going on. It takes a while, but Phil, of course, gets the best of Chilas. And fast thinking Jana takes care of the goofy guy. Roadblock. Drive through, or I'll blow your brains out. Look out, he's coming through. I don't know. Chillis was after him. Somebody looking for me? Where's Chillis? He's in the basement. I'm afraid he's had too much to drink. And everybody is happy, and I was afraid for a moment we were going to have another song. He doesn't feel like singing. Are you kidding? I've never felt more like singing in my life. <laughs> Well, hello there. How are you? It's nighttime here at the Kelly Compound. Um, I filmed these shows on Saturday, and I got interrupted this morning, and I didn't have a chance to film the end until just now. So I'm doing sort of a um, Jeff After Dark segment. <laughs> anyway, um, I think I figured out the movie. While I was down for the afternoon, I think I figured out what was going on. Sonny used the same driver's license as Phil that Peter Plum license, driver's license. That must be their code name for who's ever 
doing the drugs thing, which didn't make any sense to me before, because I'm like, didn't Sonny have his own driver's license? I thought they just gave it to Phil because he didn't have a driver's license. But apparently, I'm thinking, who's ever doing the, taking the drugs to the whatever, is using that license. So the gangsters thought Sonny was Peter Plum, even though now Phil was Peter Plum. Does that make any sense to anybody out there? Okay, now, a few times during this movie, I commented about the music, and that's because not only was it awesome, but it was written, composed by the one and only John Williams. You know, Star Wars, Jaws, Indiana Jones, Close Encounters of the Third Kind, and about a hundred other movies. That John Williams. The John Williams that was the conductor of the Boston Pops Orchestra, that guy. Yeah, this was his first film score. This is when he was just beginning. And I really enjoyed it. Um, I wouldn't even mind buying the soundtrack if it was available. All right, now. Now, whatever happened to Dick Contino? You know, um, well, the thing is, he lived till 87. And he was married to the same woman for about 26 years until her death. They had three kids together. And from all accounts, he had a pretty happy life. And he didn't give up the accordion. He kept doing music up until the point where he died. So, And now it's time for the obscure reference of the day. At one point, Joel says... Watch out for that tree! What they're doing there is a theme song from a cartoon back in 1967 called George of the Jungle. Now you might remember there was a live action version of this cartoon starring Brendan Fraser back in 1997. What? You don't remember it? I don't think a lot of people do. Anyway, the Mystery Science Theater 3000 version of this movie clocks in at about 70 minutes, and the actual runtime is 73 minutes, so I doubt you're missing anything of those three minutes they cut out. But now, why don't we watch the best two minutes of that movie from Mystery Science Theater 3000? Daddy-o, must be harry -O's father. Oh, wow, and a love scene already? Today's youth, hopped up on crack, crystal milk, formaldehyde process opium, tar heroin, and pomade. He hasn't said a word all night. All I can think of is death, death, man. Here's the lyric I wrote. Death, death, death can be very good. Please, 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 end the song now. Please, 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 end the song now. All Newman and Tom Cruise in The Color of Days of Thunder, The Car, Christine, Herbie. Our pert little racer is wearing a wool gabardine slack and kicky modified trench. She's a real deuce coop. No one's ever beaten him through that before. Well, no one else has these. Jen, I think we're on to something. Well, would you let the audience in on it? Now, I know this is bad luck, but you're already in the movie. Get him out of here. Toga. 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 Have you ever thought about being evil? I mean, really evil. Breaking my heart by the ventricles. Ooh. Why couldn't this guy be on the plane instead of Buddy Holly? It looks like he's holding a bottle of Tabasco sauce, doesn't he? He is hot. She's thinking she's gonna have to get really drunk. Mm. Got this thing figured out, Janet. Yeah, you turn these little knobs and the water comes out. McLeod. Yeah, I got it. Call my agent. Get me out of this film. Here in the wine cellars of Ernest and Julio Gallo. And that was the incredible action sequence mm. for Daddy-O. Where's Chillis? He's in the basement. I'm afraid he's had too much to drink. <laughs> <laughs> I've never felt more like singing in my life. And we've never felt less like hearing you. Let's go. Let's you. Well, I want to thank you for watching. Um, I really do. Next week, I'm not sure if I'm going to do a Mystery Science Theater 3000 episode, as I've got a very busy week. I'm going to try to do something. I've got a few things in mind that I want to try out. We'll see how it goes. 
If there is no episode, I'm sorry. I'm just very busy this week. A lot going on. But the next time I do a Mystery Science Theater 3000 episode, it'll be 1957's The Amazing Colossal Man. Yes, the Bert I. Gordon masterpiece. So now, thank you again. You take care, you stay healthy, and I'll see you when I'm back. Bye. <laughs>